Good morning, good afternoon to you all. Welcome to this talk about automation in procurement, about the hidden gems of Sharia compliance and Islamic banking. Today, as you must know, you will learn a couple of things. Uh, obviously, how to build a Sharia compliance source to pay process, how to establish supply relationships according to the Sharia ethics, but also increase procurement efficiency uh, through technology. So today I'll be your host. I'm Arno, Senior Product Marketing Manager from iValua, which is a leading spend management technology provider, um, actually catering for the needs of top brands in the world and having a special footprint in financial services and with financial services organizations. And today I'm delight delighted to be um, co-hosting with Fali Ali Khan, Procurement Consulting Director at Chartered Buying, holding a master diploma in Islamic banking. Faik, is that correct? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Arnold, for that, for a quick uh, brief about me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with iValua team and uh, 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 taking up this session on uh, the Sharia principles on how the best practices in banking uh, can, can make a lot of difference for procurement professionals. So, yeah, thank you very much. This is Faik, and uh, I am leading one of the procurement consulting organizations in the region, in Dubai, and uh, where we do quite a lot of procurement uh, transformations, procurement best practices, and uh, coming with a background of, uh, you know, doing a lot of research uh, into procurement domain, into sourcing practices, uh, into supplier relationship management engagements, having worked for last uh, 18 years, close to two decades now in uh, different industries, uh, luckily. And uh, yeah, healthcare, banking, uh, public sector, and uh, quite a few industries. And it's it's been an amazing ride so far into this journey. And I'm looking forward for this discussion and the future journey as well. So a very impressive background, Pike. But I'd like to, you know, I'd like our audience also to know you and, and know where you get this expertise from. And uh, my first question to you will be, how did you actually end up in procurement? Okay, so this is, uh, so a lot of people say that they have just got into procurement somehow, but for me, it is a little bit different. There was always that uh, instinct in me uh, of procurement, you know, uh, 25 years ago, 20 years ago, you get pocket money uh, in your college time, in your school time, so I was always of that person trying to save maximum before thinking of spending. So those instincts were always there in me. I was never a spendthrift. I think uh, a lot of times before spending, so that procurement uh, instincts were there. And uh, a lot of people call me uh, as, uh, you know, a person who does uh, window shopping a lot, which I do on my uh, personal front and which I also utilize it in my I would say the corporate life as well, because I do a lot of research. I don't wait for projects. So there is definitely a lot of instinct uh, in, in the uh, you know procurement domain, but how I pitched into it, uh, starting with procurement uh, expertise, procurement work, reviewing mortgages, banking contracts. Then around 12, 13 years ago, I moved into technology, procurement technology uh, implementation, where I used to, be a functional consultant, pre-sales consultant on the uh, procurement technology. But this was very fascinating for me on a procurement domain. So around 2013-14, I pitched into procurement right from the systems to actual on-ground procurement services uh, with a lot of research. And uh, today I am with, uh, you know, multitude of uh, experience on different industries, different categories. Uh, but the objective remains that I don't want to stop here. I want to continuously share uh, this experience, whatever I have learned. Uh, in many cases, I have learned it the hard way, uh, entering into procurement. Uh, so I want to make sure that it is not that hard or difficult for the uh, upcoming generation. So, yeah, the journey has been interesting coming into banking, core business to technology implementations to actual procurement services. All right, that's good. And then we missed the last chapter. So how did you become a Sharia compliance specialist, which is actually the, the topic of today? So how did you end up with this um, additional expertise to your proc procurement background? 
Interesting point. Now, procurement is all about researching, exploring. Procurement is all about uh, exploring different territories, new territories. So, Sharia compliance, Islamic banking, my first entry, or maybe I would say the first step was around uh, the banking and financial services. And one of the elements around that was uh, Islamic banking and Sharia compliance. So that was the first step into knowing about it, hearing about it, that, you know, this is something uh, that could be explored and learned about. And this is a new territory. So I always look at areas where a lot of people have not explored those areas where I can be an early starter, uh, take an early leap, implement it. And similarly goes with consulting one and a half, two years ago when I was thinking about it, when I was planning it, a lot of people highlighted that, you know, it is not heavily uh, utilized in this region, especially in procurement consulting. But the moment I stepped in within uh, three weeks, we started receiving the project. The first project we received in three weeks. So I usually say, don't stop yourself. If you like something interesting, prepare for it. Don't just jump into it. So similarly for Islamic banking, when I was doing the uh, banking and financial services from work point of view, corporate experience with the training program that I was uh, uh, part of, one element was Islamic banking. And I did not leave that uh, because I found so much relevance in procurement and in Islamic banking. Uh, we look at uh, the uh, ethical practices. We look at the, you know, in procurement, I'm most worried about whether my supplier will be able to support my direct, most important core businesses, core supplies. That is the most important thing. And within Islamic banking, the key and the core component that highlights and that differentiates it with the other conventional banking and with the other services is that there is not too much of a variation, uncertainty. If there is too much of uncertainty in investments, in, in all the other elements, the, in, uh, the Islamic banking will not pitch into those domains. So looking at some of these uh, elements into Islamic banking while working on the banking and financial services, I thought this is something that I need to dig into, uh, went into further uh, specific uh, qualification on that and try to make sure that how I can complement it with my procurement services and make my procurement services better and convenient for all the stakeholders within the organization and working with especially some of the Islamic products, some of the Islamic banking products like mortgages, uh, cards, personal finance, I made sure that I combine it. So when I'm buying it, the procurement services, when I'm taking from suppliers, I am taking it with the same thought process, what my sales team or my product team is trying to pitch it to their customers. So yes, a lot of these combinations, uh, I made sure to have those expertise, not just to look at the commercial part, but just uh, to ensure we have that flavor of the core work that we are doing, being in that industry, one should know what that industry talks about. Being in healthcare, one should know what the healthcare industry, the certifications that are required. Uh, 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 being in manufacturing, one should know what are the uh, health and safety measures. So all of these combined, being in procurement, we should not be limited to just commercials, just running tenders we have to go a lot beyond and i can see that change from last couple of years there is massive change people are people are broken their silos people have completely moved out their uh, comfort zones and they're now pitching into leading the categories so so yeah this is all about the islamic banking domain and uh, it's been a it's been a good journey so far good that, that's good now the audience that knows you now um, maybe you can directly dig into the, the subject and um, starting with uh, procurement categories in, in banking and kind of having an, uh, like a preview about this um, specific categories we see in banking and um, benefiting from your expertise on this. So let's let's start with this and see where, where we are with these um, categories in banking. Absolutely. So what I've done is I've tried to make sure because we run category strategies around uh, all the banking services, all the healthcare services, public sector. So anything that is required, I've tried to club in so that it 
creates a little bit of more interest in knowing the numbers. So we have created the analytics part in today's discussion before I move into the actual categories part. I want to share how big is the banking industry across the globe. So we're talking about $183 trillion across the globe of assets in banking and financial services, which is 98% of the conventional banking. Now, 2% is Islamic banking, but that 2% comprises of $4.5 trillion in terms of uh, the overall market assets, which is massive in just last uh, three to four decades uh, reaching to this uh, stage is 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 phenomenal and the growth rate on 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 a year by year basis i was reading an article recently from one of the leading ceos in the in, in the region uh, who mentioned about how their uh, sukuk which is the bonds the public bonds the sharia bonds uh, that we call sukuk how sukuk has tremendously increased compared to conventional banking bonds uh, in in last uh, couple of year a uh, couple of years time and how sharia banking especially during covid time has excelled completely uh, uh, you know and and the profitability and and we are going to cover up that profitability part as well in in uh, further uh, discussion so the question remains are we talking about 4.5 trillion dollars or just 2% I would say $4.5 trillion is the market capital. And this is how the overall market uh, looks like in terms of the leading banks. Uh, this is a recent report that we received in 2022, 2023 uh, around what are the leading Islamic banks, how they are ranked. So we have tried to just show a high level view uh, to our viewers today who have spent their valuable time on a working day and special note of thanks uh, to to everyone who have joined in so masraf al rayyan in qatar if we look at the entire ecosystem of these top eight leading banks uh, uh, it showcases that middle east far east asia these are some of the countries some of the continents areas that are heavily investing and it is very strongly moving towards Europe, uh, UK in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the shift from conventional to Islamic banking. And we'll also talk about why that shift is happening is uh, what are the underlying statements behind that shift? Uh, uh, you know, the ethical investments, the uh, trusted advisor within the Islamic banking domain. So, yes, uh, Qatar, Abu Dhabi Islamic Bank, Alenma from Saudi, uh, Qatar Islamic Bank uh, from uh, Qatar May Bank is from Malaysia, uh, uh, the fourth highest rank in assets in the Islamic banking. Uh, Kuwait Finance House, uh, then we have the two leading banks uh, within, uh, uh, you know, the Islamic bank domain. Now, if we look at these, are we comparing it with conventional banks to make it more relevant for people to understand? We talk about uh, HSBC, we talk about... Uh, uh, you know, uh, some of the leading banks, Citibank, uh, Global Bank. Uh, so what is their net worth? So if you're talking about some of the best, uh, Al-Raji Bank, Saudi, $124 billion worth of assets. If I compare it with uh, HSBC, that is around $2.6, $2.7 uh, trillion. So there is a huge difference. While they are spread across globally, but being a regional bank is massive uh, in terms of assets. Now, if we compare it with uh, uh, some of the other banks, they're all ranging around $2 trillion uh, as global banks. So as an as a, uh, Islamic finance, it is it has picked up in last four, three to four decades, but it, the growth is tremendous. So yeah, that's about uh, what are the leading banks. So to answer your question, uh, Arno, what are the categories in banking? Uh, it has a split of uh, uh, two elements, uh, which usually is there across different uh, domains in procurement. One is the direct procurement, direct procurement categories in banking. The other is the indirect, which is spread across like your, uh, uh, you know, facilities management, marketing services, your technology. Uh, so that's the split uh, that we have. Uh, even before moving to the actual categories, I want to show how the banking structure looks like. Uh, if, if we have to compare it with manufacturing, uh, the ecosystem, the revenue versus net profit, 
versus operational expenses versus procurement spend is completely different compared to you know in banking versus manufacturing or other industries so if a revenue is up to a billion dollars uh, the net profit lies between 35 to 60 percent varies come you know uh, the the it varies based on different elements the uh, market ecosystem while in covid it was a little bit different but during now the situation is different so we have kept that uh, range of 35 to 60 percent comparing uh, based on the research of uh, more than 10 to 15 banks we have tried to uh, build this to showcase and give a rough figures for for the viewers to understand when the revenue is a billion dollars what would be the net profit within the banking and finance industry now what are the operational expenses it ranges around 30 percent uh, roughly around 300 million dollar but those operational expenses will not just include your procurement uh, spend but will also include your hr spend uh, and and a few other investment related spend as well so uh, that that's what makes it 30 percent but when we look at actual procurement spend that ranges from 12 to 18 percent based on our experience based on the consulting projects that we have done uh, uh different procurement uh, projects consulting projects that we have done so it ranges around 12 to 80 18 percent so if the spend is a billion dollar the revenue is a billion dollar the spend that has gone into trying to reach that or maybe in the past the spend would have been in 120 to 180 million dollars so that's that's a quick uh, snapshot on uh, the banking if i have to compare it with manufacturing i think the expenses uh, revenue stream the net profit stream will be completely different uh, uh, and and the procurement spend because there's a lot of raw material spend the plant spend the operational running now in a banking the operational is the back end operations team but in a manufacturing plant it is the plant uh, expenses the uh, you know the capex expenses so just just a high level overview on the ecosystem of banking uh, now how what are the categories within and i have selected a few categories which are very unique to banking only but within this ecosystem, if somebody has to relate to, uh, I would say, HR, IT procurement, there are managed services, lease model procurement. Instead of going for CAPEX procurement, there is lease model procurement, which is quite relevant uh, in, in today's time. Uh, Sharia contracts are there. This is one unique thing that you will find as a category within banking, uh, especially Islamic banking domain. And uh, marketing, social media, this is usual. This is applicable everywhere. Audit, compliance, legal. Uh, now, a lot of people who have not gone through the banking exposure, the banking uh, procurement exposure, uh, I would say construction, FM projects is one of the highest spends. Is, is It ranges in one of the leading spends. Why? Because banks globally, and especially in Middle East as well, they invest in communities they invest in construction projects not just as a as a bank lending to some customers but they also are investors into it and they build those projects and further either sell it or rent it out so us as procurement professionals what do we have to support in those domains we have to get the best of uh, construction equipments we have to get the best of fit out uh, suppliers for that uh example of carpeting services uh in buildings uh in, in different domains e example of uh, safety security systems the cameras the uh access barriers so those kind of things in 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 communities is heavily required and if you also look at uh you know signing with the contractors so construction and projects is also uh, the EPC related engagements are heavily used in banking, which a lot of people uh, who are out of banking will will not be aware. So this was something I thought is quite important to share that construction spend uh, as an investment by banks, uh, their internal organization investment, which reflects into their net profit, their revenues is what banks do heavily globally. Um, majority yes in middle east as well but this happens globally uh, then we are looking at finance analytics investor relations you need to get the investors into place the insurance practices 
then the actual product department uh, i'm i'm quickly running into this slide because the next slide which i want to showcase is specifics on to which category we are talking about whether we are talking about corporate banking which products in corporate banking as a procurement professional i should know of so that is that is quite important what is the, what is the spend range as an example we have set up some figures uh which does not reflect any one or two organizations is just a random research work uh, that we have tried to reflect to make it easy for all the viewers uh going through uh, the session so some of the products these fall into the product department falls into the uh, core uh, activities the direct spend related to uh, procurement when it uh, connects with us the investment banking as i said the construction projects translate later into investment with their assets the buildings the investments that they have done into different uh, properties and and what is the return coming from those uh, either rentals or either from sales uh, uh, you know compared to the construction cost uh, I, think that's, I think that's that's a very nice um, very nice slide and the audience will really take some of this expertise and and Again, I invite the audience to ask questions in the chat if you have some specific questions about what we've said so far and about the specificities of the categories in, in procurement. I'm just conscious about time. We have about less than 25 minutes and uh, maybe more questions to, to cover. Faik, um, do you wish to, to, to go on with the procurement categories or do you want to switch on to the main principles of Islamic banking and how they apply to, to procurement itself? Absolutely. I will switch in. Uh, I will quickly summarize it. I usually get too emotional with procurement categories, <laughs> but normal. I will quickly switch in and uh, I'll try to, I, I usually miss out on time sometimes when I go into discussions about uh, procurement categories. So I will uh, uh, go into the direct categories, majority, the, the projects which are here, just to give a glimpse of uh, how a billion dollar, as an example, if an organization is spending a billion dollar on an annual basis, where are those spread areas? And, and this is more on the research. We have tried to give in some infographics on product insurance. Majority spend lies on products. Uh, in, in, if we have to do uh, any, any procurement services products, what are those products? What are those product insurance? If I have to go for uh, a mortgage, uh, uh, I, as a customer, go to a bank and request for a mortgage. I take the mortgage, but there are two kinds of insurance that come along with that uh, because banks want to safeguard that themselves with that kind of amount. One is a life insurance product. Second is the property insurance. Now, until I would say a decade ago, 10, 12 years ago, uh, the banks used to ask customers to get their own insurance for these two things and provide them a certificate. But what has happened uh, through uh, regulations, guidance, uh, and making it more structured, one-stop shop, the insurance products also come along with the mortgage with, with a minimal fees that comes along as, and as a package deal. But how a bank can take those? So the bank has to engage with... Uh, if it is Islamic bank, Islamic banks have to engage with Sharia compliant, Islamic approved uh, insurance companies, which is called Takaful. So insurance in Islamic finance is called Takaful insurance, Takaful. So to get that Takaful, to get that insurance, banks have to tie up and take those services from suppliers, the insurance, the Takaful uh, suppliers, agree on a contract for a year up to max three years, depending on how the progress happens. And looking at that, uh, the insurance products come into place. Now, who does it? It is the procurement team. Uh, you go into cash management. Today, you don't see cash in the branches like the blocks or uh, you don't see the cold rooms where, you know, the hard rooms where everything is stocked, the cash. No, uh, there is a cash management company. You will see the bullet cars, uh, kind of bullet style cars. Uh, which carry cash on and off as a user. I, I've seen a lot of them. They carry cash. Now, if they carry cash for the bank, there has to be uh, some kind of an agreement in place, uh, some kind of services fees that are being agreed between that. Uh, so who does those contracts? It's the procurement team that does it for uh, the banking industry cards. Today, I use my credit card. Uh, my credit card, when I purchase anything, I get loyalty programs. 
uh, I get Emirates Airlines, Etihad Airlines, Miles, I get points. Uh, where do we get those points from? You have to tie up, you have to sign contracts with those companies, uh, with those loyalty program technology providers and loyalty program providers. Uh, um, uh, like Emirates, Etihad, uh, some easy examples because a lot of us use cards. I use cards not uh, to uh, use it for credit, but to use it for my benefit to utilize those loyalty programs. Uh, and uh, yeah, technology is a huge spend. Uh, today in banking, you don't see uh, any uh, tangible product in terms of, uh, you know, something that you can utilize unlike manufacturing industries, healthcare, pharmaceuticals, you can have capsules, but in banking, uh, there are no tangible products. It's it's the cash deposited, ATMs and, you know, so yeah, so it majority spend is in technology and one needs to be uh, good, aware of, you know, which technologies to cater to, how to support the stakeholders in technology domain in the IT department to achieve those uh, value and cost savings within the technology so construction projects we talked about corporate banking as well we talked about and then facilities management marketing comes into the other spend you know i will just stop for a second because we have a question from the audience which is actually a nice introduction to your next slide and and the next um thing you're going to talk about which is can you explain how the concept of risk sharing is applied in islamic banking procurement transactions from cameron interesting question uh, and i think this is one of the very underlying statements on uh, procurement services on banking that differentiates between islamic banking and conventional banking now the risk sharing is based on uh, some of the uh, contracts the alignment with insurance and if there is a uh, risk let's say we take a mortgage uh, there are ethical practices, there are uh, risk sharing practices which are agreed between both parties. It is not dependent on, uh, you know, compared to conventional banking as and when the risk uh, comes in, uh, you know, banks start charging fees. But in uh, Sharia compliance, in Islamic banking, it is a little bit conservative. It supports its stakeholders. Uh, your fees that is being charged, uh, you know, is a little bit more aligned towards uh, as a profit rate, not towards as an interest rate. So that risk sharing model is very simplified and it favors both the person who's taking the loan with the bank and also the insurance parties that are involved in those risk sharing practices, which are so the insurance, which is the takaful practice is is very uniquely designed for uh, only Sharia uh, Islamic based banks and uh, Sharia banks are aligned through the, uh, you know, they are governed with certain practices uh, through the AOFI standards, which we'll talk uh, in a bit. So risk sharing is, is very fluent, very uh, convenient, agreed between all the parties within this uh, engagement. So if I, I'm just careful about time, well, about 15 minutes. Um, can we switch to the um, the main challenges of, of, uh, of, um, in banking, actually in Islamic banking, what are the main challenges uh, procurement faces and what are some of the main principles actually of uh, Islamic banking applying to procurement? Allow me to plug in the uh, slide to make it more visually uh, referenceable. Uh, yeah. it's, it's a good question. Islamic banking is often considered that it is for uh, one of the communities. But with the ethical practices that go into place with the, the uh, other benefits that come into uh, Islamic banking are massive. And because it's a it's a very rapid growing uh, industry within a banking industry, uh, there are there are a lot of benefits. So how it is governed, it is governed by Sharia principles, which are determined from uh, the Quran, from the Holy Quran, from the uh, uh, hadith uh, uh, by Prophet Muhammad and then it covers uh, some of the uh, updated points, some of the pointers which is governed by uh, our fee standards which is the accounting and auditing organization for Islamic financial institutions. So this is a governing body uh, that was launched about uh, 30, 35, 30 years ago. Uh, to support Islamic banks, while Islamic banks have been operational for about 45, 50 years, uh, very strongly in, into, into this domain. And uh, our fee standards keep guiding uh, 
the different finance islamic financial institutions towards maintaining best practices uh, towards ma maintaining those ethical practices avoiding uh, that there is no uncertainty around and at the same time uh, there is no uh, supplier or no party engaged in prohibited activities like uh, tobacco uh, related points or or we can call a few more pointers here so anything which is not and i think it it dwells quite a lot with sdgs sustainable development goals uh, where uh, uh, you know the ethics play a very important role social element plays a very important role and how your circular economy rotates around so uh, uh, these are uh, some of the interesting uh, points the banks in uh, the islamic banks they don't charge penalty now this is one of the challenge sometimes it comes for procurement i would not say it as a challenge but i would say uh, when we have to put service level agreements uh, uh, against the contracts that we have with suppliers as procurement as as a client organization we have to make sure that the suppliers are performing up to the optimum if there is any error if there is any issue that is being rectified but how can we ensure those slas are followed properly if there is a breach and supplier does not have any penalty how do we cater to it so in islamic banking uh, instead of penalties we can put in certain predefined uh, uh, you know fees predefined charges to make sure the suppliers adhere to the services if there is a delay and anything which is in their control uh, that could have been which they did not deliver so we can bring in those charges those fees but we cannot put in the uh, penalty clause so this is where uh, uh, you know with a lot of suppliers legal and uh, with the sharia team we have had uh, several discussions the risk sharing yes uh, this this was an interesting question uh, is shared between the parties involved it is not just the person who's taking a loan the risk does not stay with that only one person it is being uh, shared and at the same time it is covered through the related insurance uh, practices which are mandated and the takaful practices are are uh, are covered uh and uh, so usually in different industries when we see when we have to sign any contract with supplier it revolves around uh, those suppliers revolve around uh, legal uh, procurement and the suppliers whereas in islamic banking or islamic takaful it revolves approval for uh, the uh, uh, sharia board uh, also goes into it so there is a sharia board that reports to the board of directors or the ceo uh, and who have ultimate powers in terms of supporting the uh, islamic banking domain now this is a high level uh, snapshot how the uh, uh, islamic banks or uh, takaful insurance uh, organizations are governed there is central bank then there are insurance organization banks and they are all governed by ofi standards accounting and auditing firms that uh, that that is uh, supporting all the uh, islamic financial institutions like if i can interrupt you i have a question which i think i think fits into this um organizational aspect of the bank that you mentioned now and it's from ziad who asks um how would a global bank strategize or consolidate category spend when there are different jurisdic jurisdictions does it remain center led or is it decentralized especially when it comes to technology transformation initiatives with a local implementation partner to support so organization centralized centralized how do you see this i can heavily relate to this question and this is a pure procurement question how can i control category spend so that's an excellent question thank you ziad for that uh, so what we have done and what we have experienced in last uh, almost a decade of banking experience islamic banking experience and even now consulting engagements that we do without consolidation of categories into a procurement function you will not have a better view uh, different as an example insurance products uh, courier services huge spend in banking and financial services the mail management services if corporate banking starts to have a separate contract with courier with uh, the other banking services it you know the decentralized the supplier will play within one organization differently with different stakeholders and there will be different contracts so centralization is key uh, the category control has to be key 
the category stakeholders, the category management experts into insurance fraternity have to focus on those uh, insurance domains only. They may look at a couple of other categories, but multiple category buyers looking at one category, there may be a confusion while a person, one category expert goes on lead, there could be backup. But yes, having the centralized procurement category within the procurement function and then within procurement, having it specific category experts, whether the IT category expert is aware of those IT categories, software, uh, hardware, networking services, telecom services, are they aware of those categories while they're working or are they just looking at commercial? So one needs to be very specifically focused on the categories that they're working on. Uh, apart from bank, uh, so corporate banking, somebody who has expertise in corporate banking supports that category management expertise. And trust me, in the last three to five years, I have seen people coming from core end of the, their products coming to procurement. They, people are running after procurement domain in today's time because of the uh, exponential growth, uh, because of the awareness about procurement and because of the impact procurement is bringing in. So people see a lot of value. Uh, this is just the beginning, I would say. Next five years, 10 years, there, there is a lot of growth. But I think with growth potential, there comes a responsibility. Are we preparing ourselves? Are we challenging ourselves? Uh, to those kind of things. So it is it is very important for us to challenge ourselves to those different categories, different domains, uh, continue learning uh, different categories. So yes, consolidation uh, is the most important thing uh, within the procurement function. Having centralized functions, managing everything is very important. And if I may add on top of this is also uh, the role that technology plays. I think especially in decentralized organizations, it's still very important to have a centralized repository for suppliers, a unique source of truth for the suppliers, for instance, and also a unique repository for contracts. These two repositories need, need to be unique and centralized, and um, but still accessible to all the local departments. And you still need to have uh, or be able to support um, local um, let's say business flows, business processes, for instance. But these two things, supplier and contract repositories, need to be central and unique. Perfect. So, so Faik, now we've taken some of the questions of the audience. Um, do you want to go on with the challenges or even what these challenges are and how they affect um, the source to pay process uh, and not just the procurement work on, on categories? So with responsibility comes challenges. Now within Islamic banking, uh, I would say those uh, actually help us, benefit us. They try to support us in maintaining those controls. So one is on the penalty clause that I, that I shared just now. Uh, a few others on the challenges part, I would say, uh, when you deal with a supplier, which is a global supplier, which is not in the region, who does not understand the culture, who does not understand the uh, dynamics of Islamic banking, but but uh, as, a, as a Islamic banking, we need them uh, as a requirement. And they want to also grow their business in that fraternity, in that industry, in that country. So how that uh, alignment happens between the two, uh, the cultural difference uh, uh, from abroad, so we have to educate, we have to explain them. We have to simplify the process for them. We don't have to be rigid in that process. So yes, these are challenges, but it also creates opportunities for discussions with suppliers where we can have continuous collaboration, discussions with them, explain them that process and even simplify our contracts as well. This contract does not need to be uh, too rigid. It, it should be to support both the parties. All right, the very nice, very nice answer. Do you want to jump into um, automation? I see some questions in the audience about automation and how the technology can support procurement specifically in this um, in this realm. Um, do you think it's the right moment to to take this um, aspect of uh, today's talk? Absolutely. So automation uh, is the most important thing. Before I go into detail, I want to share is the most important thing, but. After implementation, utilization of that technology is far beyond important. So if we are implementing and not utilizing it end to end, and I have tried to create one uh, as, as a sample reference, uh, 
uh, on on the uh, uh, you know how how do we uh, practice? Allow me a quick moment uh, as a reference point. Uh, now today, as procurement, we do supplier pre qualifications. We have a Excel document. Uh, we share it with supplier. The supplier fills in. We receive it back. It is parked in one folder. Then we do when the supplier is selected, we do supplier registration. Supplier fills in another form, uh, another TDS exercise, same name of the company, trade license, and the basic details. Okay, the supplier is registered. Then when the need comes, invitation to tender, we float an RFP. Maybe in many cases we float the RFP through the system, but still we prepare it in the system, but we float it by email. Okay, why? The question is why, when you have a system, why are we requesting in separate domains? Uh, or if we are having Excel documents, why are we not implementing systems to make sure all of this is seamless? Once in the pre-qualification stage, if a supplier fills in information about their company name, about their uh, contact details, that information should stay forever. Invitation to tenders, evaluation, selection, it should fetch in all the details again and again. But what we are doing, because we have not automated the processes, we are doing, um, 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 you know, pitching into a consulting. I have got exposed to so many organizations where I see uh, Excel registration forms. Why? There are technologies to simplify our work. There is so much load of data that is happening. So if we don't automate it, we don't digitize our work, it is going to be extremely uh, difficult. So having a one information fed in by a supplier once goes until the end uh, evaluation and selection. Once a supplier is selected, we select award. The supplier receives it from the system. But today what we are doing, the evaluation also is in Excel. And then we are awarding it through an email because we have not automated the process. We have not utilized implementing the systems. And the last important point after awarding, we again ask the supplier that this is my draft contract. Please fill in your information again. Okay, bye. So the systems are available. Uh, there is amazing technology that is available. AI tools that are supporting those technologies to guide you that this supplier submitted their proposal last time, but they backed out in the last moment. So would you still like to utilize this supplier for this tendering exercise? I would not do it. I will. I, I would never do it. But because I don't have a seamless alignment between these uh, technologies, between these uh, systems, so it is difficult to have track of it. And you end up wasting your time in getting those forms filled and also of the suppliers and the stakeholders. So automation in a nutshell is the most important thing today. Uh, if you look at uh, the younger generation, the, uh, you know, the millennials, centennials, uh, the, the different people uh, uh, below 18, they're all digitized. Uh, uh, they are working on technology, on metaverse games and all. And we are talking about Excel forms. Uh, no, we have to move fast. So especially for procurement, if you have not digitized, automated your processes, please, please immediately automate because that's your, that is a heart of any organization to get the best uh, services, the best products from your suppliers. And if you're not taking it effectively, it end of the day results in a lot of waste in the process uh, in, in, in this regard. So automation is the key in today's time. It's good because it answers um, like the first question of Eshwa, which was about um, actually how is automation enabling and we see it's decreasing the workload. But he has another, uh, there was another question uh, about automation, which is when should procurement actually look into automation? The when? Do you have a point of view on this, Faik? That's an interesting point. And there have been a lot of confusions around whether to go for full stack of procurement solutions or whether to go step by step. Larger organizations, bundled services, requirement is there for all, go for, go for a complete stack. Smaller organizations, SMEs, uh, uh, mid-size organizations, if you have implementation requirements where you are facing challenge on your uh, P2P, procure to pay systems, go for a P2P system at the moment. If you have other requirements, try to see how you can club in. Sourcing, source to contracts, uh, uh, you know, so 
all of these things, uh, if you have multiple modules, sourcing, uh, procurement, P2P model, contracting module, supplier relationship management module, and the analytics, if you feel that, you know, maybe everything you will not be able to dedicate your resources for all the modules, try to go step by step, do cherry picking, what is important, go with that first. Uh, but if it's a larger organization, try to go with a full run. Uh, if, if you feel necessary as well, I would say, if you need, if you are having challenges in automating, uh, currently using everything manually, please go for a full stack. Uh, in terms of selection, in terms of what are you looking at, what are the systems providing you in terms of services? So yes, it it doesn't it, it the answer would not be a one size fits all, but go with your requirements. Explore consultants. Don't do trial and error method. Uh, engage with experts who have done in different industries, different organizations in the different region, who understand the culture of those systems implementation. System implementation is requires change management so if they have not gone through that change management exercise those organizations uh, they will not be able to support or if you feel that you'll be able to manage internally i usually do not recommend systems implementation led and managed internally because uh, unless they have uh, some of the team members have experienced it so always go with the experts allocating one two three resources who have actually done it Time and again, similar industries, similar places will will add a lot of value. You will not. I have seen. Uh, so Arno, I'll be honest. I have seen procurement systems evaluations and implementations with seventy people on the call. Seventy people on the yeah, call and supplier is presenting. Why? Because procurement system requires a bit of an integration with hr a bit of an integration with finance a bit of an integration with stakeholders okay get one stakeholder from all the places no why it's a procurement system procurement experts can do it better unless they have done it if they have done it good enough so instead of those 70 people spending one hour each for three to five suppliers evaluation get a couple of or one expert who has actually done it who has implemented it, uh, take those references from the clients where those people, those organizations have done it, implemented up and running. Uh, so uh, don't do trial and errors with systems, go with a referenceable model. Thank you for answering the audience question. I'd like to go back to the focus of today, which is actually a Sharia compliance. And, um, you know, the question I had also, and it's linked to what we said before, is what role does technology play in promoting Sharia compliant supply relationships, pretty much the supply relationship aspect of uh, the subject? If you, if you talk to any supplier, if you talk to any leading 20 person, uh, uh, you know, who are the top 20 person which are managing your 80 percent supplier, do a survey with them and they will say, I am lacking transparency. I don't know. I was engaged in the full project and I was not engaged in that project. Similarly with the banking and financial services, lack of transparency. So in Islamic banking, some of the key elements that come into place is ethical practices where the organization is spending. Are they spending into gambling services? Are they spending into uh, money laundering exercises? Are they spending into to tobacco businesses? Are they spending into services which are not allowed, which are which are quite, uh, uh, you know, there is a lot of fluctuation. Are they spending into day to day equity shares? So these are some of the questions that are that an Islamic banking asks when they invest further. So all the investments by Islamic banks are uh, very conservative, very structured. Uh, there is a good governance around those uh, spend areas. Uh, there's a lot of confidence in uh, the audience when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to the suppliers uh, uh, participating, the customers, the investors uh, investing in Islamic banking because they see where the money is being invested. The money is not being invested in a place where there is too much of uh, fluctuation. Uh, the share market market fluctuation, uh, the, the other uh, Bitcoin's uh, fluctuation. I've seen considerable one tweet and the, there's a fluctuation. So Islamic banking practices work heavily and very strongly on ethical practices, uh, reducing the uh, areas where they invest and at the same time focusing on areas 
where there is not too much of fluctuation. So these are some of the underlying statements which make it comfortable for the investors. For a supplier, I would say it is even more comfortable because their payments are made sure that they are on time. Not a single Islamic bank uh, that I've consulted with as a consulting engagement, I have seen beyond their committed time, any payment is being delayed because they follow the practices. They follow the ethics. Why would we agree on a 30 days payment term and start working to pay the invoice after 30 days and pay it in 60 days? So uh, within Islamic principles, and there's a very strong uh, auditing that comes from the Sharia audit board that when there was a commitment, why was it not adhered to? So it's, it's a win-win situation for suppliers. Uh, so ethical practices, uh, transparency, telling what you are uh, what you are engaged with your suppliers, uh, 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 what your customers need to know that, you know, where you are investing as Islamic bank. So keeping those transparency, uh, which is not uh, too clear in, in the other domains, but in Islamic banking, my experience that uh, I have learned uh, through many, many years is that there is a lot of transparency. There is a lot of uh, ethical practices because they are, they are governed. Today, we are talking too much about ESG, uh, SDG, sustainable goals. People have started monitoring when there was a payment that had to be done. Why was it not done? When there was focus on uh, some promoting the solar power, promoting uh, some of these green initiatives, whether banks are doing it, Islamic banks are the leading organizations to support financing those uh, initiatives. So yes, there is a lot happening, which uh, we are learning through SDGs today. But uh, Islamic banks have been in practice for 40, 45 years, uh, 50 years into practice to make sure those ethics are maintained, what is listed in the contracts. Good. So that's transparency. That's the, the, the master word to be able to have this ethic behavior and ethic sourcing and ethical relationships with uh, with suppliers. We're actually kind of past the 45 minutes. Uh, we're not left with a lot of time. Um, I have still a couple of questions. Uh, if we don't answer all the questions from the audience, we can answer afterwards um, through an email to make sure we, we, we get these questions answered. And um, there is one thing which I'd like to add, which is um, we have a white paper that uh, you, we collaborated with you, Fike, into writing, and um, it's going deeper than what we can do in 45 minutes. And obviously, you will have access to this white paper in the, in the coming in the coming days, and you will be able to get into the depth of Islamic banking, uh, its intricacies with procurement, how technology can help. Uh, obviously, in a more deeper, uh, in a deeper, let's say, manner than we can do in, in 45 minutes. Maybe a last question for you, Fike, and it's a question from from the audience. Um, what kind of skill set um, does a procurement professional need uh, to work in a Sharia compliant, um, let's say Islamic banking and in procurement specifically? Interesting point. And uh, as a procurement professional, uh, you know, when we do any certifications, the first level of certification comes with ethics certification. Uh, so being skilled into uh, those practices, learning about uh, how to have those transparency with suppliers, uh, you know, some of these uh, skills, I would say, uh, to look at uh, the numbers game has to be uh, very strongly there because you don't have products, manufactured products that could be tested, uh, that could be evaluated. So within banks, it's all a numbers game. So if being a procurement professional, you, your statistical uh, skills uh, or analytical skills, the analytics domain, uh, uh, you know, if you can uh, brush on those areas, I think it will make a lot of value uh, because everything around corporate banking, investment banking, uh, cards is all around numbers, evaluation, what is spent versus what is, uh, uh, you know, saved versus what is going to the supplier so the delta comes as a value so who does that evaluation it is the procurement team that does it so as a procurement professional analytics plays a lot of role uh, try to learn a little bit more skills on the corporate banking uh, islamic banking domain uh, the investment banking and uh, yes the power of persuasion i would say uh, try to connect with people be humble uh, 
one major difference i would say and and this is this is something which is which is very good uh, as an experience i came across within islamic banks uh, you don't see people shouting you know uh, we tend to get a little bit emotional in our negotiations uh, there is nothing called hard negotiations there is nothing called uh, take it or leave it kind of negotiations in islamic banking there is only only one word humble negotiations you have to respect the other parties you have to share your message be transparent try to share your uh, uh, updates but uh, make sure that uh, uh, you know we are humble so humility is one of the most important things that we have to wear as an individual while engaging because then it becomes like a, a disconnect on the cultural uh, fit kind of a thing so being humble being collaborative stakeholder management uh, teaches us that you know we connect with our stakeholders uh, stakeholders whether it's marketing it corporate banking investment banking procurement finance all of our objective is the same to win to make sure that we achieve value but it does not mean that we make the supplier or the clients or the stakeholders other stakeholders lose so the objective is to have a collaborative approach do market research always go with the best value technical commercial ethical practices today esg has started receiving a good percentage on your evaluation in procurement so make sure that we utilize those uh, evaluations and the best one wins uh, so those structures have the ethics policies in place uh, ethics trainings the uh islamic banking or the compliance related trainings in place procurement trainings in place uh, so yes couple of these skills i would say uh humility persuasiveness uh, analytics being being you know quite uh, having good uh, statistics around uh, experience so learn about your categories uh, don't just go with your commercial expertise learn about the categories that you are into and to the seniors i would say give a chance to the youngsters give a chance to a lot of people who do not have experience but have the intent willingness to actually deliver those res results don't just go with uh, a person in healthcare procurement to go with only healthcare procurement so try to have cross industry a person who is willing to go cross industries will definitely make sure he is willing to learn multiple uh categories experience and will provide good value so yeah are not that's about few skills i would say although there are lot many but few skills to focus on uh is the analytical skills i i like, i like it and i like to to close this discussion with um ethics and values which was the last uh, things you were mentioning values in procurement i think it's nice um a nice way to close this um this discussion for today thank you very very much faik for all this insight and this uh, very very valuable expertise uh, you have in the uh, in the chat um the access to the um the deeper uh, let's say white paper where you have all of this again and you will be be send this out as well by email later on so thank you very much and have a nice rest of the day thank you guys thank you thank you all for your time thank you arno for having me in this discussion see you